And so welcome to Chaitanya Subramanian, who's going to be talking about dependently typed algebraic theories. So you can uh, start, Chaitanya. Thanks, John. Uh, and thanks for giving me this uh, opportunity. This is, uh, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk about, uh, to give this talk, and especially at this seminar, because uh, uh, hopefully I, I will gain as much um, from you or probably even more from you than what you will gain maybe from from listening to this talk since this is uh, very much in the same line of work that uh, that uh, that Bruno is 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 known for so yeah just before i begin uh, maybe just make a note that my last name is actually lena subramanyam mm -hmm. so that's something that gets missed sometimes. Um, right. So uh, just before I begin, a couple of things. Um, uh, I will be moving between syntactic definitions. As you can see, the talk has theories in it. Uh, and uh, category theory. And I understand that um, people can be more or less comfortable with one or the other thing. Not everybody is equally comfortable moving back and forth. So please interrupt me whenever you want any clarifications. I can write on my slides uh, and I can also pull up a blackboard if necessary. All right. right. And the other thing I wanted to mention was that this work is, uh, oops, yeah, this work is partly joint with Peter Lumsden and partly joint with uh, Cedric uh, working with here. Okay, great. So here's an outline of what I'll be talking about today. So I'll start with an introduction and this introduction will probably be familiar to most people, but I'll do it anyway. Um, which will be looking at uh, multi-sorted algebraic theories from several points of view. Then I'll talk about um, generalizing the notion of sorts to dependent types, a particular generalization of the notion of sorts to dependent types. Uh, and then in section three is really where I, uh, I'll justify my choice of generalization of sorts to dependent types by showing you how uh, all the points of view uh, for algebraic theory, multi-sorted algebraic theories generalize very nicely to, uh, to what I call dependently typed algebraic theories. And then I'll give, I'll talk about uh, 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 an example uh, which, uh, which has to do with opitops, I'll come to that. And then if I have some time, maybe on the blackboard, I'll show you what I hope to do with these dependently typed algebraic theories. But I don't know if I'll have time to talk about number five. I think I have one hour, but if I understand correctly. Yeah. Great. So let me begin with uh, an introduction. Right. So uh, many Classes of algebraic structures can be specified by algebraic or Lobier theories. Uh, what is such an algebraic theory? A multi-sorted algebraic theory. It consists of a set of sorts, a set of finitary function symbols uh, that I write like this. So f is a function symbol that has n inputs, and each of its inputs is sorted by elements of s, as well as an output sort, which is an element of s as well. And then uh, we can construct uh, the term uh, algebra over an uh, infinite number of variables, sorted variables over sigma. And uh, we also, in, in, a, in the specification of an algebraic theory, have a set of equations between sorted terms uh, over sigma. Right? So here's an example, a very simple example, the theory of associative monoids, or just monoids, if you like. So there's just one sort. There are two function symbols, uh, one uh, a function symbol here one, which uh, 
as uh, is a variety zero and a function a binary function symbol for composition, as well as equations saying that one is a left and a right uh, unit for uh, composition and that composition is associative. You also have uh, algebraic theories of groups and rings. Both of these have just one sort, but also of unicolored operads, for instance, or even operads with a big set of colors. And that is an, uh, is an example of an algebraic theory that has a, a, a set of sorts that's not a singleton. Right. So, but there are algebraic structures that can't be described by algebraic theories. And some examples of uh, these algebraic structures are small categories, uh, colored operads, small groupoids, n categories, uh, weak n categories as well, uh, even omega categories, simplicial sets. And I'll come to these and to, to all of these examples during this talk. Uh, and two well-known and quite old approaches to uh, generalizing the notion of algebraic theory are uh, essentially algebraic theories, which I'm guessing is something that's very familiar, especially uh, to people at this seminar, and uh, uh, something called generalized algebraic theories due to Cartmel. Right, so I, I won't go into the details of defining each one of these. That's a talk, each of it, each of them is a talk in itself. But I'll give you some examples. So essentially algebraic theories generalize algebraic theories by allowing for partial function symbols. So symbols that uh, correspond to partial functions, right? Uh, so here's an example, the essentially algebraic theory of categories. So it's sorts, there are two sorts for objects and for morphisms. Uh, there are three total function symbols, source, target, and uh, the identity morphism. And they're sorted thusly. And there is a partial function symbol of composition, which means that F and G uh, uh, can be composed, uh, of type H can be composed, if uh, this particular equation, which uses the total function symbols S and T, is satisfied. And then you have many equations, which have to do with, uh, uh, for instance, saying that the source of the identity morphism is is x, on x it's x, the, the, and the target is x as well, um, that identity morphisms are units for composition, and that composition is associative here, and that the source and target of composites of morphisms are uh, right things. And then there's the generalized algebraic theory of categories, and this is something which is probably uh, more familiar to you if you know the definition of a category from, let's say, Maclean's book. So it has a sort O, but now it has a sort which is uh, defined as a family of sorts, or um, uh, more exactly, whenever X and Y are variables of sort O, H, X, Y is a sort of this theory. And function symbols are all total in that there are no equations in context when defining a function symbol. But now function symbols, of course, are sorted by these, this, uh, by both the, the sort O as well as the family of sorts H. So we have a function symbol for the identity morphisms, and we have function symbol, uh, a, a binary if you like, but uh, I'll come to the notion of arity later, a function symbol for composition of morphisms as well. But now you note that the, the, the sorts are correctly, that the composition is correctly sorted. And then the equations are much simpler than in the previous case. Um, and they're just the usual equations saying that the identity morphisms are units for composition and the composition is associative. And in fact, in this talk, I'm going to be presenting a strict subclass of generalized algebraic theories uh, that I'll call dependently typed algebraic theories. But uh, from the point of view of, of uh, the category theoretic definition of algebraic theories, of multi sorted algebraic theories, uh, I'll show that uh, all the points of view of, of, of how to see multi sorted algebraic theories generalize very nicely to this strict subclass of generalized algebraic theories. 
And we'll see that there are many interesting examples of uh, dependently typed algebraic theories. Right. So the intuition is as follows. An operation of uh, an algebraic theory looks like this. So I hope that this is big enough if I draw right here. So F has some output sort A, and F has, oh, maybe I should write A in another color. Uh, let's say blue here. And F has some uh, inputs uh, of different sorts. Right, let's say F has four inputs and they're sorted with uh, one of them is of sort A, another is of sort B, another is of sort C, and another is of sort D. But I, I like to see them as a co-product of points, of cells of dimension zero. And that the output of F is a cell of dimension zero. Now, in what I'll talk about, I will be able to define in generalized algebra, certain generalized algebraic theories in which operations are, for example, globular in that the output uh, will be a globe. So this is the three globe. And their input uh, will be a finite globular set. So, well, I won't switch colors, but let's say, let's say I have a globular set, which is, looks like this. And then I'm, this is, for instance, a finite globular set. And I'll be able to define an operation that takes as input a finite globular set and that spits out a globe. I'll also be able to define operations that take as input a finite semi-simplicial set and spit out a, a semi-simplex, let's say, uh, F here. And this is some, let's say, some semi-simplicial set. And I'll be able to do the same thing for, so this is a multi-sorted algebraic theory. This is a G sorted dependently typed theory. This is a semi-simplicial dependent type theory. Uh, and then I'll be able to do the same thing for, let's say, opitops. Uh, so here's a, an example of a true opitop. Um, and there are many such things as we will see. So this is really the intuition behind, uh, behind this work. Okay, so let me come back for a moment to algebraic theories and give you a brief overview. Oh, most of you will be familiar with all of this, but of different ways of looking at algebraic theories. So given an S sorted algebraic theory, I gave you the, the syntactic definition previously. You can build its syntactic category, so so-called syntactic category of contexts. Its objects are just finite contexts of S-sorted variables and morphisms from a context gamma to some context uh, of this form uh, are lists of terms. So uh, that are sorted by the corresponding sorts of the codomain um, and that are terms in context, uh, the domain of the morphism. And then composition of morphisms is defined by substituting terms for variables in other terms. Right. So this syntactic category of, uh, so there is one particular syntactic category, which is quite nice, which is the syntactic category of the empty S sorted algebraic theory. So the S sorted algebraic theory with no function symbols and no equations. And this syntactic category is uh, the completion of S under finite product. So it's a free 
category with finite products whose object uh, generated by uh, the elements of S. And for every S sorted algebraic theory, there is a unique identity on objects finite product preserving functor from uh, the initial S sorted algebraic theory to uh, the, the, yeah, so from the um, contextual category CS that I just defined, uh, um, should I say contextual category, the syntactic category CS that I just defined to CT. And then an amorphism of uh, algebraic theories is just a functor making the triangle commute. So I'll call this category the category of S-sorted algebraic theories. Right. And a model of um, an S-sorted algebraic theory is just a finite product preserving functor from CT to set. So since CS is a finite product completion of S, a finite product preserving functor from CS to set is just a pre sheaf on, on S. Right. That's what this line says. And so a model of, uh, of T is just uh, a functor from CT to set such that the composite uh, uh, functor from the initial uh, S sorted algebraic theory is uh, uh, a pre sheaf on S. Right, so here's another point of view of um, another way to see algebraic s sorted algebraic theories so let's fix a set s of sorts then the category of finite sets over s is the category of finitely presentable pre sheets over s and it's also uh, the free completion of s under finite co-products co because finite co-limits of representables are necessarily co-products since s is a set and we can really see every object of fin uh, over S as a finite context of S sorted variables, because if I have a, a, a finite set gamma and a function to S, then each of the fibers of the function just gives me the variables that have uh, each sort in S and gamma is a finite set. And I'll say, and I'll call the, the category of S sorted Cartesian collections uh, the category of functors from fin over s to sets over s. And the way to think about any such uh, s-sorted Cartesian collection is as a signature of s-sorted function symbols in that for every uh, finite context of s-sorted variables and every uh, output sort in s, the value of the pre sheaf on gamma a is the set of function symbols in this in this signature. Now I've put an asterisk here because a, a, a signature seen as a pre sheaf is of course functorial in gamma, which means that not only do you have a finite, uh, that whenever you have a function symbol, you also have the substitution of that function symbol by any uh, substitution of variables by variables. Okay. And collections uh, can be composed uh, in the way that one would compose uh, function symbols as follows. So um, if I have a, a collection X and a collection Y, then a function symbol of input context gamma and output sort A of the composite, so the composite uh, Y after X is the data of some F in uh, oops, in Y with output sort A and input context theta, as well as a, as well as a context morphism. So this is how I draw context morphisms from gamma to theta, but, but of function symbols that are in X. So this thing is X gamma uh, A1, and this thing is uh, something in X gamma AN, right? So that's what this set is. And this is a, 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 a co-end overall theta. And composition is a monoidal product uh, with unit, the inclusion of uh, finite sets over S into all sets over S. 
And this isn't very surprising because composition is just composition of endofunctors. Because if you take left Kahn extension along the inclusion of finite sets over S uh, into all sets over S, then every collection, is, uh, so then collections embed into endofunctors on free sheets on S. And uh, this is just the category of finite tree endofunctors, so endofunctors that preserve filtered coordinates. Um, and so, uh, and, and the composition is, uh, and this composition here is really just the composition of endofunctors. So monoids in this category of S sorted Cartesian collections are just finitary monads on um, pre sheets on S. Right, and moreover, we have that uh, if, he, if for every monad uh, on pre sheets on S, it is finitary if and only if it's what is known as a monad with addities, uh, the uh, finitely presentable uh, pre sheets over S included into all pre sheets over S. And so we have that these three conditions are equivalent for any monad on pre sheets on S. Right, so this, this, this thing is what's known as a, a Lovier theory uh, with arities um, so I should say that LT is a Lovier theory with arities in S into all sets of S. And that's the third condition here. Yeah, so uh, I repeat that. Uh, an S-sorted Lovier theory is an identity on objects functor from fin S, from fin over S, that preserves finite coproducts. And a morphism of S-sorted Lovier theories is just a functor making the triangle commute, right? This triangle. And I'll call this category law. S. And so I hope to have convinced you from the last few minutes that monoids in collections, in S sorted Cartesian collections, are exactly finitary monads on pre sheets on S, are exactly S sorted Lovier theories, which are exactly, since this category is, uh, this is the finite co product completion of S, so its opposite is a finite product completion uh, of S and um, that gives this equivalence to uh, our category of um, syntactic categories of S sorted uh, algebraic theories. Okay, we could try to play the same game by taking S to be a small category instead of a, a set, right? Because all of this previous uh, general stuff from here onwards works when S is a small category. Instead of sets over S, we take pre sheets on, on, on S. So here, when I say pre sheaf, I mean the category of contravariant pre sheaves. And so that's what hat is. Uh, and finite um, sets over S by finitely presentable pre sheaves uh, replace finite co products at finite co limits, uh, law S with law S, <laughs> uh, and Bob's your uncle. But the syntactic counterpart of the category of algebraic theories, S sorted algebraic theories, is uh, much less straightforward. Um, and what I'm going to show is that the syntactic counterpart can be constructed in exactly the same way that we do for S sorted Lovier theories, uh, when S is a nice category of shapes. Okay, that's the end of my uh, introduction. Uh, before moving on, maybe I should just ask if anybody in the audience has a short question or something to be clarified. No? Okay, good. I'll move on. Right, so let me begin with a syntactic definition of what I like to call, what I call, I will call a dependent type signature. Um, 
So dependent type signature is a graded set, is an N graded set such that each SJ is a set of type declarations overall of the signature that is composed of all the previous SI. And a type declaration over a signature is the data of a context that's typed by the signature S and a fresh type symbol. So a pair of a context and a fresh type symbol. Right, so here's an example, the empty set is a signature. Uh, here's a signature where uh, this is S1 and this is S2. And here's a signature where this is S1 and this is S2. And what are these signatures? Well, uh, I'm sure that uh, this one is familiar. Uh, mentioned it earlier and this signature is uh, is is uh, can be seen as uh, a signature that uh, for, for planar colored collections so you have a set of colors and for every um, uh, n inputs uh, and one output you have a set of um, of operations that are colored with these n inputs and with an output color Um, every signature has a syntactic category, and the syntactic category is the syntactic category of its um, corresponding Martin Lerf type theory. So its objects are contexts, and its morphisms are context morphisms. And I should mention here that since there are no terms, all context morphisms are just variables. Are just lists of variables. Uh, and given any signature S, take CS to be the full subcategory of its contextual category on the contexts that are the elements of the signature. Okay, then CS op is a, what I'll call a locally finite direct category, and I'll come to what that is. But this is a fact, and I don't want to go into the details of how one shows this, because this is essentially just some syntactic bookkeeping. Uh, for people familiar with syntax, uh, at least the definition of this category CS should be clear. Right, so what do I mean when I say a locally finite direct category? A direct category is a small category uh, such that there are no infinite uh, descending chains for the relation there is a non-identity arrow from C to D, right? So the relation there is a non-identity arrow from C to D is well-founded. And it's pretty easy to see that if C is direct and X is a pre-sheaf on C, then its category of elements is direct. Right, and I say that a category is locally finite if each of its slice categories is finite. That is, if I take a Cartesian square in cat, where this is the terminal category and this is the codomain functor, then uh, every in every such Cartesian square, A is a finite category. And if C is locally finite and X is a pre-sheaf on C, then its category of elements is also locally finite. One nice way of seeing this is to remark that the square for its category of elements is also Cartesian. Um, so I'll, I'll call a category, a small category LFD or locally finite direct if it is locally finite and direct. And from what I showed you, if X is a pre-sheaf on a locally finite direct category, then its category of elements is also locally finite and direct. Now, for every locally finite and direct category, there's a unique type signature uh, uh, whose category CS is isomorphic to S. And here I mean really isomorphic because the signature is just, uh, will just have elements, the objects of S. And um, so the elements of S is equal to, wait, S is equal to the set of all pairs 
those the boundary of c comma c for all c again for all c maps and um, a small category is locally finite and direct. Uh, uh, this is a remark. So this is not something that's that's new. This is well known. A small category is locally finite and direct if and only if it is simple in the sense of if and only if its opposite category is simple in the sense of Mackay. So one way finitely branching. And this is uh, what uh, I like to think of as th this is what I will call a dependent type signature because they correspond exactly to the dependent type signatures that I, uh, I introduced here. Sorry, which paper of Mackay is that? Uh, this is Mackay's big uh, tractatus on folds. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Mackay's folds. And so here are examples of locally finite direct categories. So if you know these categories, you see immediately that they're locally finite and direct. So any set, of course, uh, the category with two objects and two parallel arrows from zero from one to the other, the category of globes, the category of semi-simplices, the category of planar uh, elementary trees or planar corollas, uh, the category of planar trees uh, and morphisms of trees, so embeddings I should, I should write here, um, not morphisms of plane operads. Uh, the category of opitopes, uh, the category of globular pasting schemes, so some people call this theta zero, which is a full subcategory of globular sets. And all of these are uh, direct and locally finite. Right, so now I'll come to the third uh, part of my talk, which is about contextual categories. Um, so what are contextual categories? Contextual categories are something that were introduced by Cartmel in his PhD thesis. And they correspond essentially to um, their the structure on a small category that uh, describes the syntactic categories of Martin Loeff type theories. So I'll go through this structure, but if it seems a bit strange to you, that it's not very familiar to you, uh, that, that's okay. That, that, that this is something that if you've not seen it before, this will probably be a bit uh, unfamiliar, but I'll try to motivate it anyway. So. It's the data of a small category, a grading of its objects with a single object of height zero, that's noted one, and such that every object of height n plus one has a chain of, of, length, uh, of length n, uh, n plus one, uh, so this is ft of gamma to ft of gamma that goes all the way down to one because one, uh, as we will see, is the unique object in C0. Uh, it has every object of height n plus one uh, has um, not only these functions, but also morphisms called display maps or canonical projections from uh, it to its parent. And uh, given any uh, object in C n plus one, and a morphism to its parent, we can pull back the canonical projection to get a canonical projection. So we have a choice of pullback square. So this is the f gamma up here and a canonical projection p f star gamma uh, um, as well. Uh, so a, a choice of object f star gamma as well as maps making this a uh, pullback square. And this is called the canonical pullback 
of um, gamma or p gamma along f. And these, uh, this definition of canonical pullbacks are strictly functorial in gamma. So if I take this to be the identity, then I get literally the identity square. Uh, and then uh, composites are pull pullback uh, along the composite of morphisms is the composite of pullback squares, uh, strictly. And the category of contextual categories, so uh, small categories with the structure uh, and morphisms preserving the structure, one to six, is denoted CXL cat. And the motivation for this uh, definition is that the syntactic category of any Martin Love type theory is a contextual category. Right. So let me take a locally finite direct category S. And for any object in, uh, in S, I'll call the boundary of this object the pre sheaf uh, that is the sub representable minus the terminal object. Uh, uh, in the slice category, so minus the identity morphism on, on C, right? This is a standard definition. And since S is locally finite, uh, the slice every slice category is finite, and so this category is finite. And so the boundary of any object is a finite colimit of pre sheaves and is thus finitely presentable. Uh, and I define the set of all boundary inclusions by this little, by I subscript S. So, I mean, I note this set as I subscript S. And then the category of finite I cell, I S cell complexes is the category whose objects are finite sequences of um, morphisms in uh, pre sheets on S that begin with the, uh, the empty pre-sheaf and such that each morphism uh, is, uh, is given a choice of push-out squares. So this is part of the data um, where uh, it is a push-out of uh, a boundary inclusion, of some boundary inclusion. And the morphisms in cell S are just defined to be morphisms between their um, their, uh, their targets, if you like. So you just sort of freely adjoin one thing at a time? Exactly, exactly. So, so, so the point is that you can have multiple pre, uh, you can have pre sheets, the same pre sheet that's obtained by different uh, cell complexes as objects. But uh, of course, the morphisms between cell complexes are just the same. And this is, uh, this is really the crux of the definition. So because there is a fully faithful forgetful functor uh, from cell S to all pre sheaves and its image is just the finitely presentable pre sheaves Why is that? That's because uh, uh, since S is a direct category, uh, I S is a cellular model for S hat. So that means that every pre sheaf is a cell complex, uh, is an I S cell complex. And moreover, since S is locally finite, uh, every finitely presentable pre sheaf is a finite cell complex. So all I'm doing is defining a category that's equivalent to the category of finitely presentable pre sheaf but why am I defining it in this way? It's because it's opposite, it is a co-contextual category. It's opposite category is a contextual category. And this is the free contextual category uh, on S. And how do you get that structure? Well, you grade uh, finite cell complexes by their length that gives you the grading on objects, right? Uh, the unique, uh, the set uh, of objects of grading zero is uh, a singleton and it contains only the empty pre sheet. Uh, the, and we define canonical pullbacks, and this is where the, the choice of, of um, push out uh, comes into play by as follows. So if you have a, a, an object, so uh, let me recall the definition of canonical pullbacks. So I, I start with an object in CN plus one and a morphism into its parent, right? So in here, that's uh, a cell complex of length N plus one and a morphism from its, uh, its truncation at length N 
to some other, the end of some other cell complex, right? Since this comes with the choice of push out square, I can define this square as uh, to be the, uh, the, the composite here upstairs. I take the push out, that's the outer push out square, and then I get the unique map in here. And this ensures that my push out squares are functorial because if I take another G, uh, the, the map here is defined uh, as a composite in here, and the composite map here is literally uh, the choice that I get um, by, uh, by, by taking the composite. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little involved, but this is to ensure the functoriality of, uh, of, of, of choices of pullback. Can I Moreover, ask one more question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Is the idea that this cell S is equivalent to the subcategory of finally presentable objects, yep. but the equivalence is not enough to yep. have a contextual structure because yep. it's not invariant under equivalence. So you need exactly, to exactly. So the structure of a contextual category does not transfer across equivalences of categories. So it is evil. Uh, and so if D is any other contextual category, then I'll say that a, a functor from S op to D is a contextual functor if for all C and S, F of C is taken to an object of the right height. It's exactly the, the, the height is just the number of objects in the slice category over C. And that's the length of the cell complex that corresponds to C. Uh, and if the parent is, a, is the limit uh, that's that's, that's given by taking the boundary of, of C and then composing with F. So of course with ops in here. And then, and also that the morphism, the, 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 the canonical projection is the canonical morphism of limits. Then the category of contextual functors and uh, uh, whose morphisms are just morphisms of contextual categories making the triangles commute is uh, equivalent to the category of contextual categories uh, under cell S op. So this is the co-slice, the co-slice category. So here, when I put an asterisk on the inclusion, uh, that's because, of course, an inclusion is a choice of inclusion. I can build the cell complex corresponding to any representable in multiple ways. Uh, but any choice of inclusion satisfies this universal property. Right. And now I'll come to the, the, the main definition uh, of this talk, perhaps, is, which is that of an S contextual category. So an S contextual category is uh, a contextual category with a contextual functor from S op, right? That's what this means, given this equivalence of categories such that if I take the identity on objects fully faithful factorization of this morphism of contextual categories, then the second uh, factor is initial among all contextual categories with a morphism of contextual categories from cell S op. So that is equivalently contextual categories with contextual functors from S op, right? Um, along with a functor from theta d to d prime, such that uh, the triangle commutes, right? Such that cell S op to d prime, here to theta d, and here uh, some functor here f, 
communities. Um, right, so I'll just finish the slide and let me motivate why this definition, uh, why, why this is the right definition. And then the ca category of uh, S contextual categories is just a full subcategory of uh, the co-slice on those that are S contextual categories. And the idea is that a morphism of S contextual categories is just a functor between their identity on objects, uh, the, 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 the middle category of their identity on objects, fully faithful factorization, that makes the triangle commute. So here I have cell S op uh, theta D prime to, uh, oops, D prime, theta D, D. And this is, these three are identity on objects functors. Um, and these are fully faithful functors. And this is a morphism of contextual categories. So the motivation here is that we want a contextual category. Oops. right, uh, D, such that it's, it is in some sense freely generated as a contextual category by the identity on objects functor, uh, the, the identity on objects functor from cell S op. What this means is that objects in D are in particular uh, all necessarily uh, pullbacks of objects in theta d, but there's more because I could have in d morphisms between objects that don't exist in theta d. Right? That, that doesn't matter to this uh, 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 full fidelity. I could have some other contextual category, uh, let's say d prime, also with a fully faithful functor in here such that this is not equal to the identity on D. And that's where the initiality comes in. It says that there is no additional information in D uh, or uh, more precisely that all of the operations of this contextual category are between contexts in cell S op. You can't add in more operations. You can't add in more types because of this, um, uh, because I said that all objects in here are necessarily pullbacks of objects in here, but you can't add in operations either. That's the, that's the idea. And so since uh, a morphism of uh, S contextual categories is just a morphism between their identity on objects, um, factorizations that makes the triangles commute, we have that, uh, whoops, where am I? Yeah, that the category of S, S contextual categories is just this category law S in the case where S is uh, the, the, the small category, right? Because law S, what was law S? Whoops, all the way back here. Yeah. Yeah, a law S was just uh, an identity on objects, the category of identity on objects, finite co-product preserving functors with uh, morphisms making the triangles compute. Um, right, so I think I missed a small uh, remark here, which is that um, any morphism of contextual categories from cell S op to D in cat preserves finite limits. Right. So this brings me to the end of my section on contextual categories as monoids in collections. Uh, do you have any questions up to this point? Because I see that I don't have much time left. 
You can go on for another five or 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. And then I'll just introduce a particular example, which I find interesting. Okay, so I won't recall exactly how one constructs the category of optops. This is a little involved. Um, very briefly, you start with the identity polynomial monad, and then you take bias dolan uh, on, on sets, and you take the bias dolan uh, plus construction on this, uh, and then your category of opatops is what you obtain when you consider the category of all uh, operations and of all the bias dolan plus constructions of the identity monad. Um, anyway, but here are some interesting facts about the category of optops. It contains as full subcategories the category with two objects and two parallel morphisms, as well as the category of planar corollas. And that's uh, this category, the category which has an object for colors uh, and an object uh, n underlying for every natural number n, along with a target morphism between the object of colors and every uh, object n underlying, as well as n source morphisms. Uh, right. Uh, that's what the category of uh, corollas is. And it also can, so, so these two categories are the categories of uh, all the full subcategory of opitops of dimensions zero and one and of dimensions one and two. So maybe I should start drawing the opitops of, of, of low dimensions. So the category of, of opitops of dimension one is just a thing which looks like the point. The category of di opitops of dimension, uh, sorry, of dimension zero. Of dimension one, there's just one opitop of dimension one, and that is an arrow. There are n opitops of dimension two, because that's what I said. Uh, N as in uh, N as in the natural numbers, um, and each of which looks like a composite of N morphisms uh, with uh, a two cell to uh, 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 an opitop of dimension one, the opitop of dimension one. So for instance, you also have this, well, I should draw it like this more precisely, because there are zero source morphisms, and then this is a two cell to the opitop of dimension one, the target, right? So this is what I call zero. This is what I call n one for every n. Uh, and then O3, uh, well, that's a little more subtle. What you have are trees of opitops of dimension two. So let me draw one of them, like this. And let's see, here. And this is the, uh, the tree. And then from a tree, you have a three cell to an opitop that's the, the a two opitop that is the, the boundary of this tree, if you like, or, or, or the leaves of this tree along with its, uh, with its root. Uh, and then, um, so this is uh, an example of an octop of dimension three and octops of dimension four are defined uh, correspondingly. But I'll stop with octops of dimension three because the category of octops of dimension from one to three uh, is uh, the category of shapes for what Lode calls uh, colored combinatorial patterns over planar trees. So pre sheets on this category are exactly what Lode calls colored combinatorial patterns. So this can be found in a talk from 2012. Um, right. 
And so, well, I don't have much time, just five minutes, so maybe I'll wrap up quickly. So, of course, uh, since O01 is this category, ca small categories are uh, monadic over pre sheets on O01, and planar colored set operads are monadic over pre sheets on O12, and planar colored combinats are monadic on pre sheets on O13. And what's interesting is that, in fact, these three categories are reflective subcategories of O hat. So not only are they monadic over uh, sub pre sheets on subcategories of O, of o they're reflective subcategories of pre sheets on O. And uh, uh, I can talk about the, the, this, uh, these inclusions, they're Gabriel Ulmer localizations of some nice morphisms. Uh, but in each case, the idempotent monad is finitary. So what that means by what we saw earlier is that there are idempotent O type theories for cat planar colored set operads and combinants. So maybe I won't take too, the time to draw pictures of them really out of time. So I'll just leave you with some references. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that. And usually we have a sort of silent round of applause. Um, so we can do that. And uh, Yes, so if, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, well, I, it's, hi, first. Um, yeah, I, I kind of, so, so in your definition of S contextual categories, I kind of fail to, uh, to, to follow up with an intuition to, 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 uh, to understand them properly. So first of all, when you when you looked at functors from S op to a contextual category, did you expect the maps to be so so did you expect maps and S to be sent to display maps or just to any any sort of maps? They will be sent to display maps. So what but I ask for something which is slightly less than that. I ask that FC in S is sent to something of the right height. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that is mm -hmm. the, the the number of objects in the slice category, and that the the parent of F C is really the limit of the boundary of of C. So so yeah. So the right limit, which is something that's quite natural to ask, and then you can uh, reconstruct uh, the fact that all maps in S are sent to display maps. Or an S op more precisely as center display maps, because they will always be composites of of maps of the form uh, C to the boundary of C to something something something, and then to some C prime. Right. So if you have a morphism from C prime to C in S, there'll always be some chain like this. And that will be exactly the image of. Uh... And and you asked, so you said that uh, in an S contextual category, uh, the this contextual category is in some sense generated by the cell complexes over S, yeah. in the sense that you hit enough display maps which generate all the others by pullback. Yeah. Yes, but this is not uh, uh, this condition is necessary, but it's not sufficient, which is what I was talking about over yeah. here, yeah. which is that you do hit enough objects to get all the objects, but you can have more maps in D which aren't hit by, by maps in, in between objects of cell S. So, so just a stupid example. So every contextual category is S contextual for S the subcategory of its display maps. Yeah, is that true? Um, I mean, it, what exactly do you mean by the subcategory of the display maps? Do you, do you mean the the wide subcategory of the contextual category? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay. 
so the, the, the only problem with that is that I don't, um, yes, I think that should be correct unless you have, um, is, is this Y category locally finite? Or uh, is it opposite locally finite? Yeah, say, yeah, okay. If it's, I, th I, yeah. I think it should be. I see, yeah. If it's nice enough. Yeah, yeah, but okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay, that, yeah, yeah, I, I see that that would be an obstruction. Like, let's say if it's locally finite, then, then it's. Then, yes. Yeah. Okay. But, right. but, but really, the idea isn't to, uh, the, the idea is to start with something that's much smaller. So, S here would be something nice like the category of globes or the category of uh, opetops. And then you get contextual categories whose uh, objects really are all, um, are all pullbacks of finite globular sets or pullbacks of finite opetopic sets. So they can be really wild objects, but S was was quite nice to begin with. Mm -hmm. So we could uh, think of such contextual categories as the local, locally presentable ones among S contextual categories. Something yeah. like that, or presented yeah. by categories of shapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Questions. Or sorry, were you still asking? Were you still asking, Raphael? No. <laughs> and so this is um, so you you use this to describe some opatopic algebraic structures or something. I am not really on top of that. Right. So. Uh... Okay, so that's maybe. So, so, so if you if you see the category of opatopic sets, right? Oops. Right. You have some nice maps in here. So for every uh, opatop omega, uh, I can define a well, not a boundary. Call it a, a spine. That is really the tree. Uh, Cor uh, corresponding to omega. So omega looks like a tree, right? And then a cell to its composite, right? So if I take the pre-sheaf, that's just the co-limit that you get when you glue these the, the, the tree together, I call it the sub-representable that's the spine of omega. So if I localize in the sense of Gabriel Ulma, the co-continuous localization of the spine inclusions uh, of, oops. Uh, right. For all opatops of dimension, um, let's say greater than or equal to uh, two, Right. Uh, then I get cat. And if I do it for opatops of dimension greater than or equal to three, and then I need to also localize something to do with the colors, uh, I get uh, planar operate, planar colored operands, and something similar for combinants. So the idea is that uh, is that. Uh, the spines encode uh, both the operations as well as the relations uh, uh, corresponding to the associativity of composition of these operations. That's the... Okay, thanks. <laughs> any, any further questions? Maybe just to follow up to what I said earlier, to 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 continue into that direction, even though it might it might be it might be stupid. Uh, so if I have any contextual category, right? Uh, I mean, it I can associate to it a, a type theory, right? And I can mm -hmm. I, I have a unique uh, canonical map from the syntactic category of the type theory into my contextual category, right? I mean, yeah, but but, but it's not the, this type theory is not necessarily. Uh, 
unique in that. Right, where am I? Okay. So, 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 you, so you start with the contextual category C. So if I understand correctly, you say that the types in the empty context are just uh, all little C, where C is in C, uh, sorry, C1. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's what you do? And then yeah, yeah, yeah. You say that the types, uh, uh, so, so if C is in C2, then I take, uh, so the, the objects of, of C really are generating types. That's what you say, right? Yeah, yeah. But you could have const a contextual category like cell S op, where objects of height uh, uh, two, let's say, uh, or uh, are not necessarily uh, uh, generating types. They're of the form uh, C, well, yeah, I, I I don't know. I don't know. I have to I have to think about this. I think I think that it is true that if you take a contextual category C, there is some full not sorry what not even Y but some subcategory non well, I should write non full non wide. Oh really? Okay. Something like S C that generate C. Because you can have objects of height two that are, let's say, a product of two objects of height one, right? So you have X of type C and Y of type C, and that's a context where C is of type one. And this thing is, sorry, this thing is an element of C2, right? Of your contextual category, of, but of height. Yeah, two. okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, but anyway, so then, but SC now is, so if I take the display maps in there, it is locally yes. finite, I think, right? Yes. Because you need readability. Yes. So, so this is, this is a question that uh, is for me still something that's open. If okay. you take a contextual category C, uh, what, how do you, do you have a nice way of, of describing this SC? I think maybe you can just do it brutally, but. Uh, so that C would be an SC. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Well, if not, then let's thank Titania again for a very nice talk. So, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, um, so, so we can stop recording. <laughs>